this time I'm looking at a kinky headphone amplifier. It's the Model THR1. It looks very expensive, but it doesn't amplify anything. Beautifully machined and quite heavy. And three headphone output sockets at the front. There's a four-pin DIN plug, which I've not seen before. And a pair of quarter-inch jacks for high and low impedance. There's a nice chunk of aluminium for the volume knob. And a little switch for output or phones. I assume the output's around the back. And here they are, left and right outputs. Presumably, they're balanced. So there's a single-ended input for channel 1, and there's balance for channel 2. And looks very proudly made in China. And probably made in 2019. The only tells me it got progressively worse. It started off lost one channel, then the other. So we could be looking at dry joints. Let's put some power in. And a test signal, see if anything comes out. I'll go the high impedance headphone output. Just set that down. And there's the left and right going into the scope. See if we're getting the inrush current. Hardly any. Let's turn it on then. And we don't appear to have anything. Turn the volume up. No, nothing. How about this socket? Still no. Well, it's definitely not working. Now I've got to get inside it. With it being aimed at the Orjo file market, it's going to have lots of screws, I'm pretty sure. And these are 3mm hex sockets. Oh, and rather comically, the screws on the bottom are a different size again. 2.5mm these are. This has got to come off too. And it's a different size Allen key again. I'm not surprised. 1.5mm this one. I wonder if this is made in the same factory that makes these. Hmm. Not sure how this will come apart actually. The front comes off. Pretty sure I just disconnected that as I pulled the panel off. Yeah, I must have done. Because these lights are working in all sorts. Yeah. So presumably this just lifts off. It does. Look how thick this lid is. Wow. And they've even had some machine recesses for the capacitors. <laughs> but look at that. Absolutely stunning little board. Let's look at this gold plating on there. Beautiful. That's some very attractive signal routing around there. Very pretty. And it's got a toroidal transformer. And this PCB mounted one as well. And if that wasn't overkill enough, check out these transistors here. Wow, they must be able to sink oh, 10, 20 amps between them. Blimey. Got quite a mix of surface mount transistors and through hot ones over here. Oh look, there's a bit of paranoia going on here. Someone's ground off all the markings off all the transistors. Mmm, crikey. <laughs> but not the MPSA 42. I wonder why they left that one exposed. As they've taken the trouble to grind the markings off the parts, we're not going to get schematics. So if we follow the wires, the mains power goes into the main circuit board first. So I guess this transformer is going to be permanently powered up, providing like the standby voltages. And I'm guessing this relay turns on the toroidal transformer. And the output of which goes into this plug here, through this bridge rectifier and smoothed out on these two caps. Hello, what's this? I spy a burnt resistor. Look at that. It's not burnt on this side. Look at that, 75 ohms. I'm presuming that's the negative rail that's gone. But I also notice these caps are rated at 100 volts. Yeah, all of them. Crikey, what does this run on? I've not seen the specs of this thing, but they aren't kidding about high impedance. There's quite a bit of weight in this base as well. Look at that, it's just over 8mm thick. This toroidal transformer's got a surprise. It's made in the UK. Didn't expect that. And the output voltage, 2 times 45 volts. So that's going to begin with about 63 volts DC. Now that explains why these are rated at 100 volts, because you wouldn't run that on the 63 volt rated component. And 80 volts is probably a bit close, so yeah, I get it. Still a lot for a headphone amp. The underneath of the board looks pretty conventional with green solder mask, but look how hot this has got. These are the four power transistors, and they've got really hot. In fact, you can hardly see the laser engraving on these. And the legs look a funny colour. I've never seen transistor legs look blue. So having a look here, we've got Exicon ECX10N20s and ECX10P20s here. I'm pretty sure they're MOSFETs. Um, I think they're the same here as well. See so if we've got any shorts between the drain and the source. 
not there, uh, nor here. Oh, there's a bad one about its complement over here. Bad as well. I'm going to check the resistance to the gate, see if there's any damage there. 0.133k. Oh, this one here. Oh, 19.5 ohms. That don't sound good. Compare the good ones. What the circuit should look like. 1.2 meg. Similar. And this one. Yeah. Mega ohms. I'll pull these out sideways so those ferrite beads don't fall off the legs. Look at all those. Let's see if that 19 ohms has disappeared. And it has, 1.2 meg. Perfect. Same over here. Let's hope. Oh yes. Doesn't appear to have damaged anything else. This one we've got 146 ohms. Well, the same here because <laughs> they're shorted. There's the 19 ohms. Yeah. Just want to screw this and this one. Let's take these beads off. Hopefully, I don't lose them. It turns out you can get these transistors from the manufacturers directly. This is somewhat of a novelty because you don't normally get that opportunity with vintage stuff. So, I'm pretty sure these won't be fake. And they're apparently lateral MOSFETs. Rated at 8 amps. The heat sink, if you can call it that, is coated with what looks to be capped on tape. But it looks in decent nick. Can't feel any splits in it, so I'm not going to mess with that. I'm going to put the new transistors on. Put the end channel one on first. Then the P channel. Actually, now look at the different colours of these, and especially the legs, and these ones are turned blue as well. I'm going to replace them all. This one appears to be a bit stuck. There we go. Also checking. No damage on there. That's fine. Put the P channel one on. Then the end channel. Let's check these resistors. 10 ohms, yep, yeah, and over here. Yeah, good. Diode mode. Check these little diodes. That's good. That's good. Also good. And that's good. Let's swap these over to these ones. Okay. That one's good. And that. And that. Let's put these ferrite beads back on. Two on the gate, two on the source. Try and feed these in from one end. Hope all the legs line up. There we go. So check for any shorts in the captain. I think this is anodized. I'm just going to slightly scratch it a bit and then test the centre legs. 
I shouldn't really have anything. No shorts. Let's fix that power supply. There's 75 ohm resistors in a bad way. What's it measure? Oh, 3.9 ohms. That doesn't sound very good. It won't have gone low resistance, trust me. And there's a 1 amp fuse, and that's blown as well. What about this side? That's gone as well. Open soldered the wrong leg. <laughs> Quite a burnt patch in the middle. We've still got a short. No. Is it the resistor? Oh wow, 3.9. Yes it is. I've never seen a resistor go short circuit. Well there didn't seem to be anything special about that resistor, so here's a new one. 75 ohms, quarter watt. Just gonna tack that in from the top. A bit easier to get at. Put the new fuse in. And this side. I connect the bench supply to the centre pins of the bridge rectifier. So I can power it up in a controlled way. Set these to the sort of 60 volts. Common them up. Negative rail. Positive rail. And the ground. Turn them on. That's good news. About 30 milliamps each side. Well, nothing looks untoward from here, so I think it's safe to put it all back together. Put it in the 230 volt socket for over here, and the second be connected. Pop a couple of screws in. Of course, we'll need the front panel on. Let's hope it plays nicely and doesn't blow up. Let's give it a whirl. Power. Well that looks like it's working. Let's try the volume. Yes, that's fine. I guess this will just turn the output off. <laughs> yes, <laughs> nothing in channel 2. What's this do? Also drops the headphone output off. wonder what the low impedance is like. Ah, the same. <laughs> I think that's quite successful. It's got to put the screws back in. Pull this back a little bit so it's not rubbing against the um, front chassis. I've got that in the wrong position I think. <laughs> Needs to go clockwise a little bit more. Perfect. I'm rather intrigued to see the output. Is it actually balanced? And to test that properly I need a four channel scope. Plug the power back in and our inputs and the XLR cable's in here. 
the end of the XLR test lead are a bit unconventional. Banana plugs and crop clips, so I need to put these adapters in the scope. Put one channel ground in there, so the hot signal there, the cold one there. And similar to this one, but with crop clips. Adjust this to half a volt per division. Move that to the top. And turn channel 2 on. Move back down a little bit. Channel 3. And channel 4. That needs to come down as well. Well, let's see. Hmm. No, not true balanced. Not really. If it was balanced, all four lines would be wiggly. There'd be an inverted signal. And there's none. Still, it's well made. It's really nicely made. I've given that. And I've no idea why it failed. It looks to be very over-engineered. I can't see those transistors needing a heat sink anyway. Luckily, none of the top secret parts failed. Because I'd have had to reverse engineer it. And this would have taken a lot longer. But fortunately, it's more modern, and I can still get the original parts, which is a novelty. Catch you next time.